Good morning and welcome to Croydon's Sabbath School Study Time. We're so grateful that you're joining us. I don't know what kind of week you have had. It may have been a tough week. In fact, my mind goes out to those that were affected by the flight that hit the turbulence. Um, one person died and we need to remember that family in prayer, but many have been affected both physically and emotionally, including my own cousin. So just prayers going out to all of those who are affected, that the Lord will be with them and take them safely to their destination if they're not already there. A special shout out to our shut-ins from Croydon for tuning in faithfully every week and especially those from abroad that are get up really early in the morning to join us on this Sabbath day. This is the time that we can study God's Word. If you don't have a Sabbath school quarterly or adult study guide, as we call it, a link will appear on the screen that you can see where you can download a copy of what we're going to be studying that you can join in with us. It's an interactive study time, so we want to hear from you. If you're on YouTube, do not forget to subscribe, because once you subscribe, we'll be able to then take your comments in, and it's for free. So just hit the subscribe button and you're good to go. So welcome to those on Vimeo, on, on um, Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, on whatever platform you are on. We're just grateful that you are with us today. So we want to hear from you and you know how to get in contact in the usual way. It's a team effort. And so let me introduce the team for today. Our comments queen today is Sister Gabrielle. Good morning to you, Gabriella. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to you and welcoming back uh, my utility woman. She's in all seats in the studio and today she's a panelist. Welcome back, Sister Rose. <laughs> Happy Sabbath and good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here on such a lovely day. Indeed. And my, our next panelist, you haven't seen him for a while, so it's really good to be able to have him back. None other than Dr. Chidi. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. And it's great to be back. Indeed. Indeed. So it's another powerful lesson. But we can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance. So at this time, I'll ask Gabriella if she can lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sparing our lives for yet another week and bringing us here on this Sabbath day so that we have yet another opportunity to fellowship with one another. Lord, I pray that you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we read your word and that everyone listening to this will be blessed. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We're now at lesson number eight in this series, looking at the great controversy. And this week's lesson was entitled Light from the Sanctuary. The memory verse came from Hebrews chapter eight, verses one and two. This was taken from the New King James Version. And at this time, I'll ask Gabriella if you can share that with us. Of course. So Hebrews chapter eight and verses one and two. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the, of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Mm. We're going to hear some more from that and where that comes from a little later in our study. So last week's lesson, and if you can recall, it, for those of you that joined us, obviously, it focused on the 2,300-day year prophecy, the longest prophecy in the Bible. And we know that it concluded where the Millerites, as they were called, reached the wrong conclusion. They were sure that Christ was going to return on October the 22nd, 1844. This mistake was heartbreaking, and no doubt it plunged the followers into darkness and deep despair at this time. However, and this is the important part, those who eventually had the faith to study again and to seek the Lord's guidance, they were given a light, a light into their darkness. This was a light from the sanctuary. Gabriella, I'm coming back to you. Um, I can imagine the biblical promise that's found in Psalm 119, verse 105, one that a lot of us know, thy word is a light unto my feet, thy word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. I, I can imagine this became very real to those 
early pioneers that were now restudying to see what went wrong with their calculations. Um, and it led them to understand what the cleansing of the sanctuary really meant. It wasn't about the earth, of course. But here's my question. How important is claiming the promise of Psalm 119 verse 105 as we cope with our own disappointments in, the, in these days? I think it's incredibly important. So to me, this verse means that God is our direction in the same way that a pilot guides an aeroplane or a sailor guides its ship. The word of God is our guide. Mm. So when we face disappointment in life, we need to turn back to our guide, believing and trusting that he knows the bigger picture and he will direct us. As it says in Patriarchs and Prophets, like the path where God leads may lie through the desert or the sea, but it is the safe path. And that's what we need to understand and trust when we go through disappointing times in our lives. Amen. Such a wide head, wise head on young shoulders. Thank you for that. But do you agree with Gabriella? So here's my first question going out to those of you tuning in this morning. Just as those after the great disappointment needed to cling to and, and, and claim the promises. So how important is claiming the promise of Psalm 119 verse 105 as we cope with our own disappointments. Let us know what you think on that and Gabrielle will share your comments with us very shortly. So let's examine the importance of God's sanctuary. Sister Rose, I'm coming to you first of all. If you can read for us Exodus 25 verses 8 and 9 and, and, and give us some context um, as to where the children were both physically and spiritually at this time. No problem. I'm reading from the New King James Version and Exodus 25, 8 and 9 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, furnishings, just so you shall make it. Mm. Now, if I just give some context, as you've asked, the children of Israel were in the wilderness. At this point, they were in the Mount Sinai area, and Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai to meet with God and was there for 40 days and 40 nights. And some of the instructions that God was giving Moses, one was that he needed to get some gold and silver and bronze and collect all these things from the children, those who are willing to give, and make him a sanctuary that he may dwell with them. Now, that's where they were physically. Mm. But if you know the story of the children of Israel, when they got out of Egypt, they just complained about everything. And they would complain about one thing, we have no food, God provided manna. Mm. We had no water, God provided water. They were afraid that Pharaoh was behind them, he parted the Red Sea. So God did a lot for them, but spiritually, they were still in the wilderness. They did not truly have a personal relationship with God. And I think instead of trusting and knowing God, they were leaning on Moses. So it's no wonder that in chapter 17, verse 2, we see where Moses was saying to them when they were once again fussing about something, and he said to them, why do you contend with me? And why do you tempt the Lord? Because basically he was saying, why are you fussing with me? And you're, you're not recognizing that you're not acknowledging what God is doing for you. And... This was because they were not in a true relationship with God. They were not seeing that it was God's power, God's grace, God's faithfulness that was taking them through, that had taken them out of Egypt and was still guiding them. And so I think when God said, make me a temple that I can, a sanctuary that I can dwell with you, he was more or less saying, Make me something that I can be 
with you and you can start learning who I am, understanding me, trusting me, and truly worshiping me instead of just leaning on Moses, who is just a conduit through which I am doing all these things. Wow, wow, interesting points there. I like where you say spiritually in the wilderness. Yes, they were physically there, but spiritually they were in the wilderness and, and God heard. Thank you. Doc, I'm coming to you now. Um, Hebrews 8 verses 1 to 6, which includes our, our memory verse. If you can summarize what these verses are saying and, and tell us what it's all about and its link to the earthly sanctuary that uh, Sister Rosa shared. Yes, I mean, it's very interesting that um, the priests would offer a sacrifice. But Jesus was doing something different. He wasn't offering a sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. This new covenant that is being spoken about is different to the old. And the old covenant told us about, well, look, if you honor God, you will be blessed and your children will be blessed and you'll be looked after. By the way, that still applies to us today. But the new covenant is an eternal covenant, not a temporal one. And because of that, we have an eternal priest who is also a king, mm. who sacrifices not an offering, but himself. Yes. Okay. The only thing that can give us an eternal covenant, an eternal promise, is our eternal king. So he's not the shadow of things, he is the real thing. Mm. Mm. I like that. The eternal covenant or the new covenant is eternal you, thank you for explaining that so clearly let's go back to our comments Gabriella I'm coming to you there's a question on the floor that just as those after the great disappointment needed to how important is claiming the promises of Psalm 119 verses 105 as we cope with our disappointments Oh, nothing's in yet. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> a few comments coming in. Um, let's start with Dr. Liz, who says, Amen, sister. God, the great pilot. And he doesn't need any second in command. Moving on to Anthony, who said, We could think about the word of God operating or to be understood on different levels. Using an onion as an analogy for how, for how God's word is structured, we truly need to seek how the levels are integrated. And Rocco says, it is extremely important. Jesus never lost sight of God's promises. We have such a pure example on how Jesus never veered and lost sight from the light of Jehovah. We should cling to the captain of our salvation. And Nehemiah says, it's very important to note that on our own strengths, we cannot understand the Holy Scriptures, except by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who leads all men and women into true light. And lastly, Erlene Samuel says, yes, I agree. The example is set before us, so we should not get disappointed, but we must study God's word to get to know him. Amen, amen. Good points. Keep them coming in. Let me go up with another question to you all then. Um, our studio class. Um, okay, let me actually take a studio class comment before I go up with another question. Um, hello there, mum. You got a point for us. Yes. Yeah. Um, did you say Psalm 119, 105? Uh-oh, am I getting in trouble now? Thy word is a light, light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. I'm sure that's Psalm 119, verse 105. Are you going to tell me yes, off? Yes, yes, that is it. Thy word is a lamp unto Lamp my unto, feet. yes. Thank you for the correction. So we are guided by the word of God. Mm. Christ, the living word, the Bible, his spoken word, but both go together because the lamp onto your feet, the lamp and the light, that is Christ by his word or by himself. Mm -hmm. And that light shows us where we must go. That's right. In case there is something along the pathway of which you do not know mm. and you cannot see, 
So we have to rely on him to guide our feet. But at the same time, we must be sure that we are walking in his path, in the path he has set for us. We have to be careful that we are walking there in the path. Yes. Because we trust his word and we rely on his word, we accept it as truth because God is true. Mm -hmm. God does not lie. And he does not change because if he is one that changes, then Christ would not have had to come to die. He could have made another change somewhere along the way after things went wrong. So I think as the, as the older folks did when they studied and they thought they were right, and they went back to God, they went back to him for guidance, and he gave it to them. And I think if we see if things are not going the way we understood it and the way we accepted it to be, then we have to go back to his word, confess our sins, let him know that we follow what we read. Mm -hmm. And if it is that, we did not fully understand because he doesn't tell you how, when. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell you how, when. And someone might put what in between there. I do not know. But like everything else, as we see the problem that the first of a first storm, the first folks were into that caused the disappointment. Mm -hmm. And after the great disappointment, we know there is great joy, of which we are sharing now part of it. Amen. To see that reality one day. Yes. Because we know, regardless of what happened, he accepts our prayers mm -hmm. once we try to live for him. Regardless of what happens, he sees and knows the intent of our very being. Amen. Okay. And he says, whatever it is, he will forgive, he will heal, and he will help. Thank you. Great counsel, great words. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Sister Rose, you got a comment for us? Just about claiming the promise of Psalms 119, it was just thinking about the lamp and the light. If any of you have ever used a lamp in a really dark place, mm. you realize that the lamp doesn't shine way ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Most of the times what you see is kind of what is immediate in, immediately in front of you. Mm -hmm. So the lamp helps you to see what is necessary, mm -hmm. where to put your feet. Mm -hmm. You have to trust the rest of what is ahead yes. because you don't see that mm -hmm. until you get there. Oh. And so when you look at this, what, what, it's not just talking about God lighting your path. It is also saying that you ha even with the light, you have to have trust yes. because you will not see far ahead. But God knows what is far ahead. Amen. And so he will take you. And so that's what it is. Lean on him. He will provide the light and he will shine that light. But you also have to trust that beyond that light where the darkness lies, he is also there. Amen. Thank you very much for that. Great counsel. Great counsel. Um, let me go out with another question to those tuning in. Now, despite, we just heard about how God gave instruction to man to build the sanctuary. So despite being made by human hands, the earthly sanctuary served heavenly purposes. So here's my question. What should that say to us about the importance of dedicating our equipment that's used in church services to God? Yeah, so the same way that man-made, you know, the, the sanctuary was made by man-made hands, but it had a heavenly purpose. What should that say to us about the importance of dedicating our equipment used in our church services today? Let's have your thoughts on that. Well, that's coming in. Now, God not only provided a structural design, 
um, of the earthly sanctuary, but he also gave specific instructions of how services should be run. Dr. Chidi, the most important day of each year um, in the Hebrew tongue was known as Yom Kippur. Hopefully I've said that correctly. So I'm going to test your, your language skills here. Now, what's the English translation of Yom Kippur? And what does Le Leviticus 16, 21 and 29 through to 34 tell us about what happens specifically on this day, please? Well, thank you. Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, or we like to break it down to at one month, when we all come together, when people came together and were able to release and find forgiveness for their sins on that day. On that day, all of Israel had to come together. On that day, the priest would make that sacrifice on behalf of literally everybody in the community. Something quite interesting about this is that they were told they were not allowed to do any work on that day. In fact, it was a Sabbath for them. No work was allowed. And it makes me think, well, that kind of symbolizes the fact that it, it can be nothing to do with us. Mm. It's got nothing to do with our actions or our work as to how we are cleansed from our sins. Mm -hmm. The priest would do that work without any help from us. And it is the same thing that is <clears throat> applying today. Many of us get bogged down by, oh, I'm not doing this or I'm not doing that. But our salvation, our our cleansing is done wholly by Jesus Christ. It is the fact that he died on the cross for us mm. that we are cleansed. There's nothing we can add, nothing we can contribute other than the fact that we know him and that we believe in him. Mm. Wow, I like that, as you said, that, that our cleansing is, is done by Jesus is not something that we can do. So this day was an important time. Um, I'm going to take a comment. Let me take a quick comment from my mum, and then I'm coming straight to you, Rose, because I think the comment is linked to what Dr. Chidi just shared. Go ahead, mum. I like my very good friend. We are friends, uh -oh. but we have to but. obey God. Yes. Yes, he has secure. He has made everything, but we must obey him. Mm -hmm. okay. And by his grace, he will help us to obey. Yes. But we must be willing to obey. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for adding that in. So Sister Rose, just coming to you. Now, how does Hebrews 9 uh, verses 23 through to 28 explain what the earthly day of atonement was actually pointing to? Okay, again, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, not now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy, most holy place every year with blood of another. Um, and what this was pointing to, towards, oh, sorry, I think so I to needed to go to 28. Please. My, yeah, my apology. Um, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Mm. And just to kind of summarize all of this, what this is saying is that the earthly day of atonement was something that man had to do yearly yeah. for forgiveness of their sins. But it was pointing to one, Jesus Christ, who would be an atonement for our sins by shedding his blood on Calvary, by raising from the dead, and as it says in verse 24, entered into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us, to put away sin 
by his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, mm -hmm. apart from sin, for salvation. Mm -hmm. So basically, the Day of Atonement was what man did until Christ came. Christ came, and it was one, one time only deal. Mm -hmm. He died, died once, he raised, and he saved us from our sins. And so we need to recognize, just as, as, as Chidi, Chidi said, that it's nothing to do with us. We have no works to do. We just need to trust and lean mm -hmm. on God. Mm -hmm. Obey him, as Sister Saul says, mm -hmm. worship him, and be his children. Mm -hmm. So trust obey those are the things you know as long as we i suppose follow what god has set out for us absolutely chidi anything to come back on yes yeah, thank you sister that was a good clarification because the obedience is us coming to him and accepting him mm -hmm. for salvation mm -hmm. for salvation there are many other things that we need to obey for life and for our development but the the key thing is that we come to him mm -hmm and accept him mm. and believe in him. That is the key to salvation. Yes, 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 I like that. I mean, it, it makes it absolutely clear on that one. Let's take another studio class comment at this time. Been very quiet so far, Sister Jackie. So let me say good morning to you and let's take your comment. Good morning, Elder Johnny, and good morning, everyone. Yes, just following on from this same same point, that actually, um, whilst on the on the Day of Atonement, whilst the priest was doing what he was doing, um, Dr. Chidi said earlier that everyone had to come together. The task that they had was that they had to confess their sin. They had to pray in, in prayer and supplication. They had to present themselves to God. So part of what Sister Saul was saying about the obedience, but they, they had a task there. They also, that, you know, the fact that they weren't working, what they were doing is they were presenting themselves to God. They were pouring themselves out and they were making sure, as Dr. Chidia said, again that they were accepting and believing what God was offering what was being offered at that time that priest was doing in the temple as that priest is doing for us now wow. I'm sure we're going to come on to that indeed indeed great thank you very much for that Gabriella let me come to you any comments coming in at this time yes quite a few comments so Estelle says they show be blessed and used for the purpose that they were dedicated for and after the service put away and not misused by others. Oh, Anthony says our sanctuary or church instruments must be dedicated for the glorification of God. Psalms 150, 3 to 6. If whatever we place in the sanctuary has the inner motive in mind, we're assured of God's blessings. Rodney Smith says everything in the service of God is set aside for holy use. Dr. Liz Clark says, even though the earthly sanctuary was made by man, it was directed by God for his purpose. Some of today's sanctuaries are not directed by God because of personal gain, money and pride. Curtis says, it is paramount that any equipment or device set aside for holy use in the church must be dedicated to God. As it represents holy use, to give honour and glory to God for his purpose and care. Leston says, by dedicating the equipment to God, um, the church emphasises that all tools and resources are to be used for his glory, enhancing the worship experience. Vereen says, yes, I think everything we use in our church must be dedicated to God. And lastly, someone adding to Dr. Chidi, Dr. Chidi's comment, uh, Dwayne says, we need to do something on the Day of Atonement, that is, turn up and accept the process. Mm -hmm. Interesting. To the Day of Atonement, people are, are kind of clued up on this. Um, that leads to my next question. Now, when we think historically, Christ moved into the most holy place in 1844 and began his work. So... Considering, this is my question, considering the importance of the Day of Atonement in the earthly sanctuary, what should that say about us living through 
the spiritual day of atonement. In other words, as, as Dr. Chitty pointed out, the preparation that was needed at that time and that mindset. And if we're living through a time of uh, the spiritual day of atonement, what does that say to us about our preparation and how we should be living at this time? Let's have your thoughts on that. And uh, Gabriella will share them with us shortly. So both of Daniel's visions captured in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8 referred to a, a, a judgment scene, a, a reference to the cleansing of what we now know, the heavenly sanctuary. The first angel's message of Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7 also says the hour of his judgment has come. So Sister Rose, I'm coming to you. What light can you shed regarding the outcome of the judgment as specified in Revelation chapter 22, verses 10 through to 12, please. Revelation 22, um, 10 to 12 says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look in Daniel 12, 4, we see where Daniel was told, but you, Daniel, Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, when we pop over into the into Revelation that I've just read, we see where John is being told, do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book. In other words, Reveal it. Do not keep it back, as Daniel was told. Reveal it. Daniel was told to hold on to it until the time, the end of time. Now John is being told to receive it, to reveal it. And he said, for the time is at hand. We are being warned that the time of the final judgment is nigh. And soon we are going to reach that point of no return. And as it says... In the following verses, for those who are just, they will remain just. Those who are unjust will remain unjust. Those who are filthy will remain filthy. There will come a day and a time when we have to decide which side of the controversy we are going to support. Mm. Are we going to be sheep? Are we going to be goats? There will be a time of the final judgment where will your soul be? And that is what this is telling us, that there is a time of final judgment. Mm -hmm. And where you are at that time is where you will stay for your final resting place, mm -hmm. so to speak. So you need to start deciding what side you're going to lie on. Where are you going to put your trust? Yes. Those who are with God need to be with God now. Yes. Yes, and that is the absolute message. You know, we, we, we can stop here now because that's the important point. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sister Rose. But this thing of finality, this, this thing of saying, well, there's a point of no return. Dr. Chidi, one of the most famous parables in the Bible is that of the parable of the ten virgins, as recorded in Matthew 25. So, I mean, how does the judgment and this finality, this, this judgment that Sister Rose was just speaking about, how does that play out in this parable as well? Yes, the ten virgins, I think we all know it. There were five wise and five foolish. Something that strikes me is that the reason why the five foolish didn't get in to the wedding wasn't because they were late. Mm. It was because they didn't know the bridegroom. Mm. He said, depart from me, I, I don't know you. And in fact, that gives us the essence of what is wisdom and what is foolishness. Mm. 
is not how many books you've read, how many university degrees you've got. Wisdom is whether you know God or not. If you want to be counted amongst the wise, in other words, if you want to be in the kingdom, with the bridegroom, with Jesus, it comes to knowing Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. And that takes, well, what does it mean to know someone and to know anybody? We have to spend time with them. Yes. We have to listen to them. Mm -hmm. We have to speak with them. We have to have experiences with them. All of those things, and all of those things we're going through in life today, some of them are not so good, some of them are fantastic. Mm. All of those are experiences we're having with Jesus that are bringing us closer to knowing him. Mm. Sometimes we think that the problems that come against us are, oh my goodness, it can't be from God. Sometimes he allows it mm. so that we can get to know him better, so that we'll be with him in the kingdom together. Wow, mm. wow. It's a, you know, I've read that passage so many times depart from me I know you not and that's the thing whoa you know we don't want to hear those words but all of us have got an opportunity and as that parable says all of us will sleep but hey sister Rose let me take a comment from you and then I'll see if we've got any studio class comments coming in go ahead sister Rose well just saying a little bit more on what Chidia just said the all the virgins took oil but some took more than others. Now, what did the oil do to their lamp? The oil was a fuel for their lamp to keep burning mm -hmm. so that they could see the light. Yes. These virgins who didn't have any oil left ran out of energy. Mm -hmm. If you have no energy for your lamp, you can't keep going. And so although they had walked some of the walk, they ran out of energy. And so at the crucial time, which was when they should be burning for Christ, they ran out of oil. Mm. And that is what we need to remember, mm. that some of us are very vigilant and we are so, we, we are hot for Christ now, mm. but are we going to still have oil in our lamp when it is the crucial time when the bridegroom comes? Whoa, powerful words. Let me take a brief comment from yourself, Mum, before I go to Jackie. Go ahead, Mum. Oh, yes, Rose. Rose tend to have stopped, stepped mm -hmm. That's okay. on things there, which it's good to which share. Is very, very good. Yes. Um, you see, it's our oil must be an everyday commitment, as others have been saying. We must be able to study God's word, read His word, be with them and so on, and help him all the time, all the way. Sometimes, because of certain things in a person's life, they might lose some oil at the time. <laughs> but if Christ is our supplier, and you are dedicated to him, you are dedicated to him, it means your whole being, and everything thing that you have, whatever it is, we know that it's by God this was able to be granted unto us. He gives us health and strength. He gives us be able to learn and all these bits and things. But as it's pointed out many times, these virgins, as the scripture said, these foolish virgins, but anyway, they were not, but it's just maybe in a way, but they did have oil in their lamps. As Sister Rose said, they all had oil in their lamps. But you know, I always remember when I was small and I saw persons with a nice big lantern, then now the lantern had to be cleaned. If they're going on a long distance, the lantern must be cleaned. The, sh the, 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 the shade of it must be cleaned at such a point that you don't see any marks on it at all to hinder the light coming through. And also, they always had some spare oil in a bottle. That is what I grew in, you know, growing up and I learn and I see these things. So we know that, um, 
Many times some ministers ascribe the oil as to be the Holy Spirit and different as they see it and how they would tend to, 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 to place it. But we know Christ within and the Holy Spirit conveys for Christ and the Father. Yes. And so with all these um, parables which we have before us, mm -hmm. it was part parable and it was practical thing because Christ saw the people, he saw the people, they had a function and he saw them going to their function. And there is where this parable came about. Yes. There is how this parable came about. But we must ask God to help us. Help us. Want him more. Indeed. Let him take us, give ourselves to him, and let him help us that we'll never be tired of wanting him. We wouldn't be tired of trying to learn of him. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Jackie, let me take a comment before, for, from you before I come to yourself, Gabrielle. Yeah, just... Um, back to Revelation 22, really, and just thinking that the second coming, at the second coming, everybody, everybody will have had an opportunity before that to make a decision for themselves about whose side they are on. We are living in the hour of judgment. Mm. And therefore, this is that time mm. when we accept, as has already been said, what Christ is offering us. Mm. Everyone at that point when that phrase is said, it's irrevocable. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. That, you know... There's no going back from that. So the hour of judgment is not a fearful time. It's a time when we know that our, our God, Christ, is advocating for us. So now is the time yes. when we can supplicate to him and just make sure we surrender mm. to him. Because when those words are said, there is no going back we will have made the decision. The universe is watching. I remember in a previous study, we, we, it came to, the universe is watching. Christ, God through Christ has done everything he can to save us. That's what is happening now. And that is why we are to make our decision. That is what the delay is. Christ wants us all to be saved. He wants us all to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. And so he's doing everything he can. The universe mm -hmm. is looking on. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it just made me think about where I am and what I need to do because this is our day of atonement. We're living in it. Amen. Thank you so much, Jackie. Gabriella, there's a question on the floor about considering the importance of the day of atonement. How should we be living um, or, or conducting ourselves as we live through the spiritual day of atonement? Any answers to that or other comments, please? Yes, of course. Um, if we start with Valerie, she says, we all need to trust in God and believe for there's no other way. Anthony said, our spiritual day of atonement is our everyday consciousness that it could be our last day on earth. And hence, we must perpetually apply ourselves to make our calling and election sure daily. Erica said, we should draw to have a closer walk with God. We should have a hunger for righteousness now. Mm. Rodney says, the work in the sanctuary above must have a corresponding work in our lives here on earth i.e. as God wipes out a specific sin against my name in heaven, I must stop committing that sin here on earth. Yes. Nehemiah says, we are blessed that we have a high priest whose sacrifice was sufficient to reconcile man to God. We need to believe, confess, repent, and continue living by faith of our high priest. 
Curtis said, daily re-consecrating our lives to God and with faith and trust in God. We live our lives pleasing and acceptable to God, knowing that our sins are forgiven. Amen. Erlene said, we should, live our, we should live every day as our last, for we do not know when our names will be called and our case will be decided. For Christ is interceding right now on our behalf. Leston said, incorporate regular prayer and, if appropriate, fasting into your routine. These practices help you focus on spiritual matters, draw closer to God and earnestness in seeking his presence. Bev says, as in the last days of the atonement, we too should afflict our souls, which is turning away from the sin by confession and living a life that is pleasing to God. Dwayne says, so we should live decently with everyone, being careful to uplift and encourage each other. Many of us have a lot, lot of work to do on our to do on our behavior and attitude. And lastly, Vereen says, we must live life as if every day is our last by keeping in tune with God. Amen. A, a, a word that was used in the lesson um, when we were discussing this about the, the, the ceiling and the time was the word probation. Um, you, you may consider probation when somebody may even come out of prison, say, and they serve this period of time where they're being assessed to see if they're okay. Um, probably more commonly where it comes to employment, that when you've started a, a job, there's going to be a period of probation to make sure that you are suitable. So here's my question to our world class. In today's world, most people will perform their best during a probationary period for their employment life. Suggest one thing that can easily distract us from passing our spiritual probation for everlasting life. So what? Just say one thing. Some may have a list. Just say one thing that can easily distract us from passing this probationary period for everlasting life. And Gabriella will share that with us shortly. So despite the significance of the former earthly day of atonement, family and friends of the high priest may have been a bit anxious as he walked into the most holy place on that sacred day. Some of us know there would have been a rope tied around his waist. There would have been bells at the bottom of his gown so that they could hear him moving around to make sure that he didn't die. So, Dr. Chidi, how does Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through to 16, and also chapter 10, 19 through to 22, how do these verses fill you with the confidence about Christ being in the heavenly most holy place? Well, it's fantastic news to know that Jesus Christ is our high priest okay. and that he understands everything that we've been through. Now, that's quite a big statement. All of the issues, the temptations, the problems that we are going through, he's familiar with. He's not just a God who's distant from on high. He's been through it. He's walked the path that we're going through. So this is fantastic news to know that he is our priest mm -hmm. and he's on our side. Now, now, here's something slightly controversial, but bear with me. I'm going to put it to you that justice... God's justice is not for the just, it's just for the unjust. There's a lot of justs in there. Mm -hmm. Now, let me explain what I mean. See, justice just means you get what you deserve, okay? Now, if we got what we deserved, none of us would cope. None of us could survive. But our God is not a God of justice to the just. He's a God of grace and mercy. He gives us what we don't deserve. It is only those people who have turned their backs on God's mercy, turned their backs on his grace. They then have to receive justice, what they deserve. But we, God's children, have been offered and are continuing to be offered grace and mm. mercy from the high priest himself. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that's one of my mum's favourite phrases when she speaks about justice and mercy. So no doubt in a moment um, she may have something to add to what you are saying there. I'll, I'll come to you in a moment, mum, so you, you can prepare what you're going to say. Um, and, and that's so important. It's, it's, it's understanding. And as Jackie said earlier, it's recognising, you know, 
the judgment. It could be a time of emancipation, of freedom, of, of getting there. You don't have to fear judgment. But we need to make sure all of the above, as we've already said. Sister Rose, um, share a description uh, of the most holy place, if you could, as recorded in Re Revelation 11, verse 19. And just, again, give your insight with regard to the whole conflict of the ages and, 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 and what this verse is saying, please. Okay. Revelation eleven nineteen says... Then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noise, thundering, an earthquake, and great hail. Now, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. in answering this question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go straight to Wednesday's lesson mm -hmm. that deals with this question. And it says in Wednesday's lesson, here in the dazzling brightness and blazing glory of the presence of God in the throne room of the universe, at the very base of God's throne, we discover the law of God in the Ark of the Covenant. Here in the most holy place, God's justice and mercy are revealed. No earthly power can change God's law because among other reasons, it is enshrined in the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. Hebrews 8.10 says, For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in, on their heart, hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Mm -hmm. So entering by faith into heaven's sanctuary, we find pardon for our past sins and power to live an obedient life through Christ who died for us and writes the law in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just showing us that God likes a bit of entry. Mm -hmm. So he comes with lightning and noise and thunder and earthquake and hail. In other words, I'm a speaking, mm -hmm. I am here Listen to me, hear me, because I am your powerful God. And what the verse, um, one of the things that the reading I just read said, no man can change God's law. Where is God's law? In heaven. We see lots of things on earth that man is changing. You can do this, you can do that, you can be this, you can be that. You can be whatever you want. You can manifest whatever you want in your life. And this is saying to us, God is saying to us, I am the true judge. I am the only one who makes the law. I am the only one who can truly judge you mm. lose, using my law. No man can honestly judge you yeah. because no man knows your heart. Only God knows your heart. So listen to God. Mm. Lean on him. Look up. Because he is the only one who can be real. Satan will tell you all sorts of things. And he will try to be all razz, razzle dazzle as well. Mm. But he is never going to take you to the final resting place of your of, of Jesus Christ. Wow. He has other plans for you. Amen. You are preaching today, Sister Rose. Okay, so Mum, has Rose said it all? Do you have anything to add? Everybody's on fire this morning. Amen. I tell my, my friend my friend Dr. Chidi, I always call him Pastor Chidi. I don't know why. <laughs> Dr. Chidi, my friend. I'm so glad he brought in mercy and grace. Mm -hmm. When sin occurred, remember, before judgment should have been passed on Father Adam, which would have obliterated him to dust, and Christ couldn't die for dust, he must die for a human being. Mm -hmm. He pleaded mercy. God emptied grace. Because of God's mercy and grace, we live. Because of God's mercy and grace, the planet exists. So with all we are doing and all we are saying, 
God's mercy, when we look at you, would see all his love, his kindness, his forgiveness, his patience, his tolerance. All the things there is great compassion in his mercy. His grace is his almighty power to help us to live above sin mm. and draws us closer to Jesus. Right. And when we want, decide we want Jesus more than anything else, Many, we don't please our friends and then we decide to say to go to say to Jesus, well, look, forgive us. We don't do those things. It must be, he must be first and last in our lives at all times, mm. in all that we do. And when we do that, by his grace, we'll be able to understand that is more our lives will be dedicated to him. All that Sister Rose said is true, where the, where the law is and all that. I was reading it this week. It is so true. We need Jesus more than anything else. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Jitz Chetty said, not your not a degrees, not that and that and that. As no, some time ago someone said, I was surprised to hear that from that person's mouth. Don't and say said, oh, these young people been to university. And I wanted to say to him, what does that say? What does it mean? That you go to university has nothing at all with trying to know the Lord for yourself. He is our teacher, he's our guide, he's our all in all. And so on. So, and Sister Jackie, as she said, we have to be preparing now. I agree with her and everybody concluded that. He, let Jesus, asking for the Holy Spirit to help us as we prepare, because we know we have no second chance. Amen. Amen. So you've heard it there. My mom is in agreement with all of you. So um, I'm glad to hear that. Otherwise, I would get in trouble. Right. Let's, um, Gabriella, coming to you. There's a question on the floor about things that may distract us from our spiritual probation to everlasting life. Any comments coming in on that, please? Yes, quite a few. Um, let's start off with Erlene. He says, one thing I think is self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. Anthony says, losing sight of Jesus' word and the Bible and being influenced by misleading views of certain others. Lily said, the love of worldly pleasures, e.g. material gain and relationships. Maxine said, the cares of this world. Leston said, one major distraction that can easily divert us from passing our spiritual probation for everlasting life is worldly pursuits and materialism. So that's coming up quite a lot. Worldly pursuits, materialism. Rosalind said, uh, by compromising with the bad practices of the world and allowing self to take place of God. Sandra said, the, the devil's deceptions. Mm -hmm. Um, Donna said, we can easily fall, fail our spiritual probation period by being easily distracted by earthly achievements that seem very important to us to meet requirements of our job instead of preparing to meet Jesus. Curtis said, forgetting our first love experience with God when we are zealous for Christ and desire to win the world for him, but then we become distracted with the cares of the world on our personal Bible time. Bev, and lastly, Bev says, one thing that can turn us away from our probation for everlasting life is unbelief, not trusting God and his words. Without God, we are lost. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a strong theme that is coming through there from the comments that, that, that came in online. And th this concept of probation, um, you know, it, it, it is so important, but it's the staying power, it's the longevity, and it's trusting the Lord and, and, and living the life that is so much important. Jackie, you got a comment? Yeah. Um, what, when you asked this question, I made a note looking at other people and what they are doing those sinners over there mm. that is what's going to keep me distracted from looking at where i need to be looking at those other sinners over there mm. it, 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 <laughs> it it makes me want to be very sober and mm. think about where i am not looking at other people mm. 
Thank you. Thank you for your honesty and for sharing that. And, and that is so important. Don't forget the, the evil one, the person that has caused this conflict, this great controversy. He is a master of deception. He is a master of getting us to focus on things that may not even be that important. He is a master of preventing us from focusing on the things which are important. So there's so much coming out of this lesson today, but let's take it on board, every one of us. Um, let me go up with another question to you. Bearing in mind of who our heavenly high priest is, what is the most important aspect for you about our heavenly high priest? Right? What is the most important aspect? Share your thoughts on that as we look in that, some, at that point some more now. So in a court setting, there is normally a barrister um, to present your case to the judge. Um, there's a barrister probably for and against, and the judge makes a decision. I'm no expert on court matters, um, but I'm just keeping it very simple. Now, isn't it great to know that our heavenly barrister actually loves us? I'm not dissing any barristers that may be online who are just doing it for the money, so to speak. But isn't it great to know that our heavenly barrister actually loves us? So, Sister Rose, on this same kind of theme, Hebrews 10 verses 9 through to 14. We've got enough time for you to read that, actually. What do these verses say about the significance of Christ's role? Okay, reading from 9 to 14 says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he was perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, I know I said before, and I'm going to say it again, Jesus' death on the cross was a one-time only deed. To for our sanctification. It doesn't need to be done again. And this is what this is saying. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at it from that analogy that you said as being in court, what it is saying is that we have a high priest who knows all his stuff. There is nobody who's going to go to court and fool him. Mm -hmm. And it says here, for he offers one sacrifice. He offered one argument and when he completed his argument, he sat down. Nowadays, the people would say he dropped his mic. Mm. He was like, I'm done. Mm. There is nothing else that needs to be done. I am now sitting down, and I'm just watching you all running around, and I will wait until you've run out of steam, realize that you can't beat this. I have done it. The battle is won. It's done. Those who are in with me, are sealed as long as they continue to be sanctified. And that's all that this is saying. It's done. It's finished. He said it on the cross. And so what he's saying in court is, I've won this battle. I've won this argument. And there's nothing else to be said. Mm, wow. Thank you for that. Um, studio class comments. Um, I'll be coming to you shortly. I'm sure your, your, your brains are ticking over on that. But before I come to you, let me just go to Dr. Chidi. So Sister Rose has painted that picture um, about the character and the importance of who our Heavenly High Priest is. So, Chidi, what else do we discover about our heavenly high priest from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, please? The great thing about Jesus is that he's not just our priest. Amen. He's also our king. Amen. He's not just the barrister. He's also the judge. Mm. And he's on our side. Amen. We cannot lose. 
this is something, you know, sometimes when we think about judgment, we think about something quite negative, something fearful. Uh, as Jackie said earlier, it is something to celebrate. When your barrister and your judge love you, and they are all for you, really we have nothing to fear. Mm. But there's one thing. It also tells me that he is a God of both sacrifice mm. and service. Mm. Yes, he's a king, and he serves his kingdom, but he's also sacrificed himself. And I do think that should have some parallels for our own life. Our lives, yes, we are children of the king, so we must be royalty. There's no question about that. But also we're called to serve. Mm. We were talking about the parable of the ten virgins. Well, what was the purpose of the lamps? It wasn't just so that they could see. It was to attract people to where they are. I mean, they didn't have street lamps in those days. If you saw those lamps at that, um, at that celebration, people would know where to come to. Mm. We need to shine our light so that we can lead people mm -hmm. to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We must have a sacrifice of our own lives. Not what I want, not what my goals are, but what is it that Jesus requires of me? Mm. Amen. Amen. So let me take a comment from Jackie, and then I'll come to you in a moment, Mum. Go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, just connected to the, the whole Christ's role in, in the sanctuary. You know, there's so many things, you know, throughout the sanctuary, we see Christ. We see him as the lamb that was slain. We see him as the priest. We see him as the bread of life and the showbread. We see him, you know, <laughs> the incense, his prayers is mingled with ours. We, we, we see him and his outstretched hands with the nail prints mm -hmm. on carry my name mm. so when god is looking that he we cannot stand before a, a awesome god we are sinful and so when god looks and sees jesus and those nail prints with our names yes. christ knows my name and because christ knows my name god knows my name and so the only way I can stand before God is if I accept the salvation that Jesus gives because that's what makes me spotless. I stand before God only in Christ's righteousness, mm -hmm. only in his righteousness. I have none. Mine are filthy rags. So, so it's just so important to recognize what, God's, what Christ's role is before God on my behalf, yes. the yes. judge, the advocate, the, 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 the priest, everything on my behalf and on yours. Amen. Thank you for that, Jackie. Mum, did you want to come in with something? Yes. We know Christ is our all in all. And without him, we would not have been here. And this planet would not have been existing still. But like everything else, when God has made something to last, he finds a way. He works a plan out, and it's there. Now, in this same hymn we have, it says that, as we approach God through the virtue of Christ's merit, we are clothed with his priestly vestments. Mm. He places us close by his side, encircling us with his human arm. While with his divine arm, he grasped the throne of the infinite God. Mm. And he puts his merits as sweet incense in a censer in our hands in order to encourage our petition. He promises to hear and answer our supplications. Mm. Yes, Christ has become the medium of prayer between God and man. He has also become the medium of blessing between God and man. He is combined. He is divinity and humanity. Amen. And so we know that Christ is our advocate. He's a living advocate. 
in days went by, the, 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 the lambs, they were dead. They covered them and they were dead. But no, he's alive. And the vision of Jesus Christ, it is stated, the Son of God and the Son of Man in the heavenly sanctuary with the angels giving out the everlasting gospel, which is being preached this day for as long by God's grace. We pray that all will make use of it. Mm, Accept Christ as our personal Savior. Amen. And to do his will, not what we want. And what because this other church is doing that, and other this other church is doing that, we must do the same thing. And when God has said in his word, it must not be done. And these are the things we have to pay attention to. These are things we have to pay attention to. We do it. And we've got people who say, oh, it's this and it's that. We need to have a change. We need to do that, that. Okay. God does not change. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to take our final online comments from yourself, Gabriella, as our panelists prepare their takeaway comments for us. Over to you, Gabriella. Just a reminder of the question um, on the floor. It's what is the most important aspect for you about who your heavenly high priest is? So starting with Dwayne, who says he is fair and just. Vereen said that he is my mediator. Karen says, the important thing for me is knowing that despite myself, the sins ever before me, Jesus is interceding on my behalf daily, that I am his inheritance and he wants to save me and is doing all to save. Dwayne says, the high priest has multiple roles in our salvation, an advocate and the person who paid the penalty for my guilt. Mm. Erica said, that I can go to him without fear, knowing that he loves me and he is merciful to me. Mm. Anthony said, not our will, but God's will be done in our lives. Mm. The submission of Christ to God throughout his entire life and ministry on earth should motivate us to go to, to, to motivate us to go and do likewise, likewise, as Jesus always did. Donna said, our, high, our heavenly high priest is interceding for us. And that is extraordinary because he loves us with an everlasting love and had offered his life for our sins. Jennifer said, Jesus is our lawyer, the judge and saviour, all in one, need no one else. Dr. Liz Clark said, the most important aspect about my heavenly master is that he'll never change. Mm -hmm. His love is true and unconditional. He doesn't walk on his words. He woke me up this morning, undeserving as I am. Louise said that he is my mediator. He is pleading for me in spite of my sinful life. He is interceding for me. Pauline said, God is just and of righteous judgment and a God of truth. Maxine said, my high priest knows everything about me and wants me to be with him and he loves me. Mm. Erlene said, the most important aspect is that knowing that I am not worthy to be saved just because of the love of Jesus, who is my defender, pleading on my behalf so that I can be saved. Praise the Lord. Curtis says, he is my judge, saviour, mediator, and friend. And the last comment on this, Leston said, as a high priest, Jesus offered himself as a perfect and final sacrifice for the sin. This sacrificial act atones for the sins of humanity, providing a path to salvation and reconciliation with God. Amen. Thank you so much. We're right out of time. Sister Rose, what's your takeaway point for us today, please? My takeaway is Jesus will return whether you believe it or not, whether you know him or not. And if you know him, is there enough oil in your lamp? Mm. Are you fighting the good fight? Are you running the good race? Will you finish it? And will you be there rejoicing when he comes? Amen. There you have it. Those are questions directly to all of us. How will you answer? Dr. Chidi, your takeaway point for us, please that Jesus has paid the price for all of us. Our job, our role, our joy is to accept it. And when we accept it, allow him not just to work on us, to, to work through us. Amen. 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 And finally, Gabriella. My point is that God is on my side. He loves us and he's doing everything possible for me to get to heaven. 
And whilst we are not safe by works, it's what am I doing? Am I putting in that time? Am I putting in that effort to spend with God and doing that all I can, that I can also make the kingdom? Amen. For me, look, just like a lighthouse is there to guide boats on a stormy sea on a dark night, Jesus who is the light from the heavenly sanctuary and is our high priest. He's willing there to give us the light to direct us through our stormy lives. All we have to do is to follow his guidance. I want to thank you all for your comments and for our time of study. Today, we want to thank God, obviously, as ever, for leading out for our AV team, our moderators, our panelists, our studio class. I uh, just want to thank you all for this powerful lesson study that we've had today. Next week, by God's grace, the foundation of God's government. What is that? Be sure to study so that you know the answer. After a short break, it will be our divine service. So be sure to stay with us. But at this time, we'll bring our study to a close. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we want to thank you so much. We want you to thank you that you are the light of our lives. But Lord, we need to follow the light. We need to make sure that we can see the light. We need to make sure that we have oil. And, and, and if we don't have oil nowadays, we need to make sure we have batteries and that the batteries are fully charged. So dear Lord, help us that we will follow you and follow the light and that we will follow the light eventually to take us home to live with you for Jesus' sake. Amen.